guys are great. Thank you. So, um, I had an introduction. All set up. Right there, right there. Right there. Right there. there it is. Okay. Okay. Um, first, I would like to humbly apologize um, that I forgot to introduce one of the um, uh, collaborating partners who helped bring people in the door and make this conference a success, and that is Gordon Cook of the Cook Report. There's Gordon right there. <laughs> Gordon performs an invaluable service for the community. Not only does he do this Cook Report, he runs a really great mailing list, which has um, a whole bunch of brilliant people on it. Um, uh, all of them are subscribers to the Cook Report, of course, which uh, I, I think is a good value. Um, okay, let's see. Um, uh, uh, so now, oh, so just, just to make sure that you guys remember, the lead sponsor without whom this conference, w I'm not kidding, we couldn't have done this without Alcatel Lucent, Neil Salzman and his great crew um, who build networks for cities. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Sunlight Foundation, the Millennium Communications Group, and Google, and our tech support sponsors at Lantech Online, which is providing the 65 megabits per second um, in and out that runs this conference, and 37 Signals, which provides that chat software. Um, so now, next panel. What can we learn? from municipal networking experiments so far, successes and failures. Um, there's nobody in the world better qualified to lead this panel than Esme Voss, the um, perpetrator of a blog and a media experiment called Muni, Media Venture called Muni Wireless. Um, Esme is a reformed intellectual property lawyer from uh, the Netherlands. Um, she founded MuniWireless.com in 2003 to cover all kinds of municipal wireless broadband projects, and not only wireless. So Muni, it started, it's, she's expanded. It's sort of like, um, well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and Esme has uh, been a delight to work with uh, and a good partner for uh, Freedom to Connect this year. Esme will introduce her panel. Uh, who all, every one of whom is also a hero of mine with one exception and it's only because I don't know him and that's Ken Biba but I expect that by the end of the hour and a half he will be also so um, so Esme come on up so I'm going to uh, so when David was planning this conference several months ago, uh, I approached him and I said, well, I'm not doing conferences anymore this year. So my audience, a lot of whom are municipal officials, uh, equipment vendors, and ISPs who are involved in the planning and deployment of very large wireless networks. They can be citywide, they can be hot zones. Um, I said to him, hey, why don't we have a panel? Because there are a lot of misconceptions about municipal wireless. The incumbents had done a very good PR job painting it, with, like, the whole thing saying, oh, municipal wireless, it's a failure, but that's not true. And the problem is, all right, the problem is the journalists all believe that, and they keep writing and copying each other's wrong work. So propagated throughout the ecosystem today, especially in, in mainstream journalism, is the idea that mini wireless has failed. And I didn't want that to be propagated here, especially at David's conference, and now that we're applying for RUS and NTIA funding, because I think a lot of the communities that really need municipal wireless networks, because they don't have broadband otherwise, could definitely use some, some better press and good information and facts. So when I put together this panel, I invited, uh, among other things, Sasha Meinroth, who's been involved. He, he's run community wireless networks. He's now with the New America Foundation. He's got a lot of information. I've asked Ken Baiba of Novarum also to uh, give a presentation. He's written for Muni Wireless. His firm, Novarum, is an independent uh, a firm that tests networks, not just Wi-Fi, 
3G, WiMAX, all kinds of networks. And he was the founder of one of the first generation of wireless equipment companies called Vivato. So he understands this market very well. And I've also asked Aaron Kaplan, who runs the uh, Vienna Austria Community Wireless Mesh Network, to give us a presentation on how this really works in the real world in Vienna. Uh, one of the problems today that I see in the United States is people just talk to each other. They don't see what's going on outside. They're not interested in it. That's a big mistake because, you know, business, the Internet, it's international. You have to see what's going on outside the world. You have to see what people are doing. And finally, I've asked Dwayne Hendricks, who's a very good friend of mine from way back when, um, because he's also been a wireless ISP, and he knows all about not just how to deploy wireless networks, but also the regulatory problems that we've gotten ourselves into. Basically, what we're doing is now going around and around in circles, and now that we're going to get all this funding, we're just going to go around in circles, unless we're aware of it. So um, what I'll do is I'll ask my panel, please, uh, to, to take their seat, and I will um, start off with um, history of municipal wireless. Um, and what's, how it began, uh, the initial deployments, what's gone wrong, what people are doing right, where we are today, just to give a background for what people are going to present. And I'll try to leave some time open for um, questions. And I'll end this whole session with a poem that I wrote in 15 minutes on a Virgin America flight. So it's not William Blake, but hopefully it gives people something to think about. So uh, let's talk about the history of municipal wireless. I started MuniWireless.com in 2003 because all I wanted to do was to aggregate news about what different cities in the U.S. and around the world were doing in wireless hot zones. At that time, people were not putting up giant citywide wireless networks. They were focusing on hot zones. And most of them were doing it for two reasons. One, for business development. They wanted to, say, unwire an entire city center. The others were actually doing it because they had no broadband. These are small communities in America, in Indiana, for example, in Idaho, that are only on dial-up. What they had done is they said they were trying to look for wireless ISPs to come in and actually bring broadband of the traditional type, whether it's a DSL or cable broadband. They didn't care. They wanted just the kind of broadband that Americans in big cities are getting. Because they didn't get that, the mayors and the city councils of these towns said, well, we had to do it ourselves. So they started setting up their own city-wide, town-wide, because they're very small towns, wireless networks. In many cases, they succeeded well because, first of all, there was no local incumbent, cable or DSL, who opposed these plans. Many of the, the plans that did not get funded and pushed through the city councils were in larger communities where there was a cable operator or a DSL operator opposing them. Uh, so those are, that's the very first, you know, municipal wireless networks with small towns and then also bigger t cities that have hot zones. What ended up happening is that the bigger cities like Philadelphia and, and Minneapolis and San Francisco, they, people started saying, hey, you know, maybe this technology can actually solve certain problems. Number one, the problem of giving people connectivity in a lot of areas where they want it. For example, if you're sitting outside with a laptop or you're sitting near a convention center and the convention center is charging you 30 bucks a day for connectivity, or if you're in an, an area where people cannot afford to pay $30, $40 a month, hey, maybe we can set up very cheaply a giant wireless network. So they got companies like Earthlink and Metrify and Kite Networks. Um, Kite and Metrify are not around anymore. They're in bankruptcy. And Earthlink uh, pulled out of the municipal wireless broadband uh, uh, business because it wasn't profitable. So what ended up happening is you got all of these, you know, there was a lot of hypes. It went through that hype cycle and then crashing down. But it's not municipal wireless that failed. It's those firms that failed. Earthlink failed in its business model. Kite failed. Metrify failed. But you can't say Muni Wireless failed. And by the way, in almost all the cities that failed, one of the reasons is that they didn't get any support from the city government itself, the city, whether it's financially or as an anchor tenant, which is what they're doing in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. So let's talk about the successes. Where has it succeeded? Well, Minneapolis is a very large network that covers about 70% of the city. It's not citywide yet. But their model there is the following. The city government said, look, we're going to put out to bid um, a project for a citywide network. U.S. Internet, a local uh, service provider, won the bid. But the city is paying U.S. Internet $1.25 million a year for the city's own use of the network. So what you're seeing here is basically an anchor tenant who's paying for its use of the network, 
It gives the service provider an incentive to build out the network. There's a certain return on investment. They have to build the network in a way that meets that anchor tenant's needs. So that means there's some kind of service level agreement put in place. And it encourages other large institutions in the city to become anchor tenants as well. I mean, you've heard today the presentation of Lev Gonick from One Cleveland. It's a very similar model where they've tried to get large institutions to come on and be on the network. The other successful uh, network is Riverside, which is now being run by AT&T. But I'd also like to point out a couple of things about Philadelphia. I spoke to the... Um, uh, the new network owners, they took over the Earthlink network in Philadelphia. So it's not, it's not true that the network in Philadelphia has been shut down. It's just been taken over by new owners. And what they've done is really something very different from Earthlink. They followed basically a model similar to one Cleveland and Minneapolis where they have tried to get the city as an anchor tenant to test out a few applications. For example, they're, um, they're doing um, uh, parking meters, wireless parking meters, apparently the city, you know, we all have these coin-operated parking meters, very old-fashioned. So they're trying to get that done. Um, they're also getting um, uh, the universities, the colleges, the large institutions to come onto the network, also as anchor tenants. They've completely changed uh, the, the, the way the network has been architected so that now it's actually faster. And I spoke to Derek Pugh, who runs the Philadelphia Network, and he says, uh, as of December, they have about 137,000 unique users for the month of December. Um, whereas in June, when they took over the network, there were only 6,000 unique users. So as you can see, more people are using the network. He also gave me a very inter interesting statistic, I think something that we cannot ignore, and that is about 50% of the, the devices that are logging onto the network are Apple devices. So they're probably a mix of iPhones and laptops and maybe iPod Touch. I asked him if he could break it down to the iPhone, iPod Touch, and he said, no, they just see that the operating system is a Mac OS X. But I've spoken to other people who own networks, and they say that 40 to 50 percent are, they think it's iPhones. So again, you know, since I started Mini Wireless in 2003 and it's now 2009, we can't just look at the network. We have to look at what's come in in the meantime in terms of the devices. And because you now have very small devices that, that have very good Wi-Fi connectivity and people are using it to connect Wi-Fi because AT&T's 3G network is really lousy, we're seeing more and more demand, on-the-go demand for Wi-Fi access everywhere not just in offices, not just in homes, but also outdoors when people are walking around trying to get Google Maps and information on the Internet. So I would like you to keep, keep this in mind while we're talking about wireless networks. The other network that's, so Philadelphia is not a disaster. It is not anymore a failure. Earthlink's model failed. Philadelphia is not a failure. The second one that the incumbents and the anti-municipal people want to call a failure is the Lompoc Network in California. Lompoc is in the middle of California, sort of, you know, halfway between San Francisco and, and L.A. when you're driving. It's uh, very well known for a federal prison, uh, like a luxury prison, it's a sort of tennis prison. And um, it's also known for a, an Air Force base. Now, Lompoc was considered a failure, again, like Philadelphia, but in reality, today, they've turned the network around. And here's a really interesting use of the network. Um, there are a lot of contractors who come up to Lompoc and work in the, in the federal base and um, the prison. Now, these are people who stay one week, two weeks in, a, in an apartment, but you know, they're not going to get DSL connection. They don't sign up for AT&T's, I don't know, one year. So what they do is they actually use the network. They buy daily or weekly access to that network and use it because they're also mobile. They're contractors. They work on different sites. And the, uh, the guy who manages that network actually told me that it's very... It's, um, it's very um, um, convenient for them, and it's also very cheap. You know, if you're a contractor, you can just sign up on a month-to-month -month basis, $16 a month. I mean, that's nothing, right? And you could sign up for AT&T's, uh, uh, um, you know, data service, and it's much more than that. And this one you can use actually on, on your laptop if you're a contractor doing business there. So as you can see, um, where we're moving today also is that there are networks like in Ponca City, Oklahoma, and in Rock Hill, South Carolina, that are using the network for the latest application that's now the rage in all the U.S. cities, wireless automated meter reading. So what they're doing, also in New York, they're replacing all these meters. You know, you need a guy to run around and dodge the nasty dog in the backyard. That's over, right? 
So what they do is they install these water meters or electric meters that have a wireless chip that talk to a box on the street, right? And you put wireless meters on the street, and they just collect this data in real time. So, so for example, the city knows, the utility knows where the leaks are because, you know, they can see the water coming down suddenly, hey, how come over here, you know, this is happening? They can detect fraud. A lot of people who tap, you know, the water lines and electric lines. And the third thing they can do, of course, is since the wireless network is up, they can use it for other purposes. For example, providing free Wi-Fi access in public parks. For example, per, um, allowing public safety, the police officers, to be able to do their work in the field. So, in other words, what I'm saying right now is the reason why these cities are setting up large Wi-Fi networks isn't just to give people free Wi-Fi so they can sit there and do their internet and email. It's because there are all these things that Wi-Fi can do, which you can't do on WiMAX yet. That was the question. Why can't you do it on WiMAX? It's much cheaper. It's multiple use. And it gives the city and the residents, you know, really basically bang for the buck. So um, with that, I shall let Sasha take over. Thanks, Esme, and thanks to everyone who's here. I uh, actually wanted to start out by thanking everyone who has been working uh, for so many years uh, to achieve our shared goal of bringing affordable broadband access to every resident uh, throughout our society. And I say this because when I think about the potentials that are before us today, uh, I'm reminded of the question that David Bollier asks in his book, Viral Spiral, where he says, who will set forth a compelling alternative to centralized media and build it. Because when I, I think about what went wrong with municipal wireless, uh, I think it's clear fundamentally that many network providers failed to create systems that actually met the needs of their communities and met the needs of the communities that they purported to be serving. Back in 2000, when I was just a wee lad, and uh, we still thought that the problem of building sort of a, a free, open source, metro scale, mesh wireless technology from the ground up was a summer project. Uh, we in the community wireless networking movement proposed a really novel, at the time, idea, which is that everyone should have connectivity, that it's a freedom that everyone should enjoy, that it should be everywhere, and that everyone should have the ability to connect to one another and to the internet as a whole. And today, we're perhaps no longer meeting up in my living room uh, and hacking on things and building equipment from scratch. And, uh, but yesterday, uh, in between games of Rock Band 2, I was reminded of this history as David, or sorry, as Aaron Kaplan and Rich McKinnon, who's right here in the front and the co-founder of Austin Wireless uh, Project, were swapping notes on the newest technologies that are available and how do we implement them in real life in different locales around the country and in our own backyards. And so some things, at least, never seem to change. But today I'm more of a policy hacker and an advocate working on behalf of public interests groups uh, to educate congressional staff, FCC commissioners and administration officials, the media, allied organizations, all of this on issues related to telecommunications, broadband, and open technologies. And in essence, I translate geek into walk in the hopes of affecting meaningful changes to a fundamentally flawed status quo. My background, however, is in radical media activism. And this advocacy and this community-focused uh, drive has consistently been the critically important foundation for the successful wireless networks around the globe. So back during the turn of the millennium, I helped coordinate the indie media movement, a uh, movement that normalizes notion of journalism from the streets. I've built radio stations and community wireless networks. I've organized rallies and unconferences. So I feel both David's pain and joy uh, when he puts these things on. I founded concert venues and foundations. And I've protested inju injustices and been beat to shit by cops just for daring to exercise my right to assembly. And this right to assembly is very similar to the right to communicate, that we all not just enjoy, but is an inalienable part of civil society. And I reported on what was happening in my community, founded a newspaper, and in the face of a repressive local administration, helped develop the strategy to take over our city government. 
But what I came to realize is that documenting problems, standing up for injustice in our society, was simply not enough unto itself. In fact, what we needed was a local media that would cover the issues that no one else wanted to and contest the inequalities that were systematically eating away at our local community. And what I came to appreciate was that how we share our experiences within the world infects our epistemologies and warps for better and for worse our understanding and comprehension of our communities and of one another. And in fact, media activists everywhere, from the commie pinko left to the reactionary wacko right, have for years been waging a war to establish platforms for telling their stories and narratives. And their goal has been no less than to impact mainstream culture and shift the very foundations of civil discourse. However, media creation and the documentation and telling of our stories without information dissemination is impotent. And at the recent 2009 Emerging Communications Conference in San Francisco, my friend and colleague Malcolm Matson uh, asked the question, who will control local connectivity? And in so doing, I think he, he exposed the fundamental question facing civil society at the dawn of the 21st century. Because when we create media that documents local injustices, uh, we still have no means to disseminate this vital information to the rest of our community. And in essence, we are locked out of this public discourse through a systemic media disenfranchisement. So what's needed then is to create alternative media dissemination systems and through these networks, implement fundamental changes to civil society before it collapses under the weight of our own ignorance and inequity. And this, at its heart, is what has driven much of the community wireless movement. So as a historian by training, I understand contemporary telecommunications through the lens of its historical antecedents. So analyzing the parallels to our past allows us to understand both the contemporary tensions and battles and also to project forward and see the future. So when Alexis de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, he was writing about an engaged body politic, right? This whole new system of government. He was talking about a knowledgeable citizenry that swapped information through the most advanced packet switching network the world had ever seen, the United States Postal Service. And in fact, the post office staff at one point made up roughly 75% of all federal employees. The post office was, in effect, the federal government of the United States of America. And democracy in America, and the very foundations of our modern civil society, was predicated upon massive government intervention and subsidization of our cutting edge communications and information dissemination network. Newspapers were provided free, not low cost, they were provided free transit through the postal system. So vital were they considered to the health of our fledgling democracy. And the history of telecommunications is rife with extraordinary examples, cautionary tales that we must learn from if we were to avoid the pitfalls that we faced in prior epochs. And disruptive technologies throughout history have been recaptured, commoditized in unexpected ways, had their democratic and participatory potentials systematically decimated over and over and over again throughout telecommunications history. So the telegraph that was so vital to bringing forward an, an age, an era of instant communication was also the bearer of unprecedented speculation and the advent of the mass, mass communicate, commodification of information inequalities. And the telephone provides perhaps even an even more instructive cautionary tale of the dangers of allowing corporate conglomerates to drive telecommunications in the United States. Paul Starr's book, The Creation of the Media, documents the rise of the home rule telephony movement during the first decade of the 20th century. How many people have heard of the home rule movement in telephones? Just a, a handful. But while much of the remainder of the 20th century uh, was owned by Ma Bell, the first decade of telecommunications saw the flourishing of independent providers, cooperatives, affiliations, and coalitions. And AT&T systematically destroyed this home rule movement, a movement that at one point accounted for some 40% of all telephones in the United States at its height, 40%. 
And AT&T did this by refusing interconnection of these interdependence. In essence, in the telephony movement, leveraging its ownership over long distance lines, the telephone system's backbone, to curtail and control edge network development and implementation. And if telephone demonstrates the viability of instant communications for the masses, the Roaring Twenties were a golden era for communications technological development. The radio era was a time when democratic potential of instant communication seemed unstoppable. And following the footsteps of uh, Marconi and others, the 1920s saw an explosion of innovation from so-called radio amateurs around the globe. And as we all know, even this genie was put back in the box. Through the creation of the Federal Communications Commission and under the guise of organizing the public airwaves, uh, our airwaves were taken away from us and reassigned to an elite few, setting the foundation for the next 75 years of spectrum regulation, frequency allocation, assignment, and disenfranchisement, and lack of diversity and heterogeneity. And for the sake of time, I'll skip. Thank you. For the la sake of time, I'll skip cat TV, peg channels, battle over free nets, local access, over-the-air rebroadcasting, low-power FM radio, but the stories go on and on and on. And community and municipal wireless is, without a doubt, exemplary of this cycle of innovation and usurpation. So originally, community wireless was birthed through the unlikely coupling of uber geeks and activists, but incorporated into its fundamental tenets was a strong commitment to social and economic justice disrupting of the status quo networks that failed to meet the needs of local communities, and an interest in diverse and heterogeneous business models that differed wildly from the ones that so remarkably failed to deliver the services communities and local constituencies wanted. Somewhere along the way, the ideals and salience of this movement were momentarily usurped. And by 2004, our lexicon was purged of such phrases as social and economic justice and communications as a human right. And instead, we began talking about a far more nebulous, less critical digital divide and the need to spread digital inclusion. Today, a half decade later, with far more communities demanding their communications grievances be addressed, we have a $7.2 billion intervention by the federal government that will, at best, only alleviate some of the most deplorable conditions communities nationwide face. And the best intentions of NTIA and Russ, our US staff, may yet be usurped by the legions of corporate lobbyists. And I can tell you, working inside the Beltway, it is legions of these folks that have descended upon these agencies with their tin cups held out in front of them. And when I testified before NTIA two weeks ago, uh, Far, I realized very quickly that far too many of our current measures, business models, and implementation plans have marginalized considerable resources and expertise within local communities. So whether you look at, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to San Francisco, California, from Springfield in Chicago, Illinois, to Houston, Texas, systematically, one of the hallmarks of failure has been the deprioritization of local control and accountability. This, in turn, has often led to less effective solutions that decrease the salience of IT resources for local residents and substantially contributed to the failure of so many corporate franchises. Instead of directly addressing the shortcomings and a clearly broken business model, this public-private partnership has placed communities in a subservient position to corporations who, on the one hand, claim to be acting in their best interests while they seek to extract maximum resources in the shortest period of time possible. Thus, our very lexicon around community wireless and municipal wireless revolves around returns on investment rather than the far more meaningful social and economic impacts to local residents and the importance of broadband resources in fostering a 21st century civil society. The same companies that first ignored participatory and democratic potentials of broadband technologies also attempted to prevent implementation of competing networks. Lobbying to pass state laws in over a dozen states 
that made it difficult or illegal for local municipalities to deploy their own systems. And after failing to stem the tide and failing in their own endeavors, these corporations have now spent untold cash, as Esme alludes to, to support a narrative that municipalities, rather than they themselves, were to blame for the shortcomings we've seen in so many locales to date. The fact remains that there is a massive, behind-the-scenes, epic political battle being waged inside the Beltway and across the United States between forces working to create a more open, distributed, and participatory... Sorry. Participatory. This is very awkward. It's like you're too far. <laughs> that or my, maybe my gut is too big. I'm not sure. Uh, but <laughs> the fact remains there is a massive, behind-the-scenes political battle being waged inside the Beltway and across the United States between forces working to create a more open, distributed, and participatory media and telecommunications future, and those who favor centralized command and control regimes. So the threats that we currently face in Washington, D.C. are quite daunting, but entirely surmountable. It's if we're wise in how we approach current interventions. So we must not allow our vigilance to waver or be thrown off track by the red herrings and misinformation that is so often being manufactured to lower us into a false sense of the so-called failure of municipal wireless. More often than not, a scrappy fellowship of public interest groups and a small handful of advocates and, sorry, and visionaries are all that stand between this more democratic participatory potential of current telecommunications innovations and the forces fighting to create more increased command and control. So at this critical juncture in telecommunications history, try to lean forward again, is both within our power to dramatically alter the next generation of communications, as well as our responsibility as knowledgeable participants uh, to actively participate in the policy hackery that is so desperately needed to avoid a more dystopian future. So today, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the technologies that we've been building over this past decade. The work that Aaron Kaplan and others have been doing and we will talk about momentarily is particularly exciting in this regard. And regardless, I hope that many of you will join me in taking part in hacking 21st century telecommunications. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. My partner, Phil Bellinger, uh, we run a consultancy called Navarro. Um, we have a long history of being wireless. Um, the fact that uh, Wi-Fi is based upon Ethernet rather than ATM, which arguably means that it's a success rather than a failure, I take personal responsibility for conniving in the back rooms of the IEEE committees in the early 90s. And my partner, Phil Bellinger, uh, to his, uh, to his eternal um, uh, shame, is the, was the original chairman of the Wi-Fi Alliance, and the name we have Wi-Fi is due to him, and the reason we have WiMAX is because it has to be better than Wi-Fi. It has to be more than Wi-Fi. So, um, what I'd like, what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is um, we come from a long history of building products and shipping products, and therefore, in the matter of building and shipping products, we've created hype. And so Phil and I take some responsibility for the technology hype that has been present in Wi-Fi and in wireless in general. And when we formed Navarum, we did it as a penance to speak truth about technology for a change rather than to hype. And so one of the things we've been doing for the past two years now <coughs> is taking efforts to actually bring science and reproducible truth to wireless by actually measuring it. So we went out and measured it. I personally have driven now seven WiMAX networks, 45 municipal Wi-Fi networks, and 95 2G and 3G cellular networks. Well, I'll tell you a bit about those results. There's a bit more results coming on the next few months. We've also recently completed the first set of real, I think, of authoritative tests on 802.11n, indoors and outdoors, and the opportunities that that offers, both in terms of 
uh, scale, performance, interference reduction, uh, the ability to build real networks. So what we hope we'll see is some of the first real independent data about how these networks operate and why. And the, this data covers the period of the last two years and hence includes some of the Muni Wireless 1.0. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Muni Wireless 1.0. Thank goodness, it's over. The hype was way out of hand. We had a series of failures, but also some successes in terms of Darwinian processes of discovering what business models and what technology actually works. And we now have the opportunity to actually use this stuff in constructive ways, rather than in ways that are overhyped, the technology can't match, and can't match business models that can't exist. So I think the first two things going around with 1.0 is the impracticality of a free lunch. Impossible expectations of being able to do 100% indoor coverage at 20 to 30 nodes per square mile with technology that had just been deployed. Attempting to do that with laptop clients. These were outright lies. There are a few concrete applications that use these were based on a promise. There are contracts that were poorly written and utterly immeasurable in terms of being able to deliver on what was actually happening. And frankly, free is not a sustainable business model. If you go to a mayor and say, we'll make you famous, you don't have to pay us a dime. In fact, we'll pay you money. You get free internet access. And by the way, we'll put it in and take all the responsibility. That's Philadelphia. That's why it failed. And because there was no money, not enough money there, Earthlink put in probably, my guess is they put in 40% of the infrastructure they needed to make a decent network. When it first went in, it was under 30 nodes per square mile. Right now, it's about 45 to 50 nodes per square mile. And it's a network that probably has 80 to 85% of coverage of the covered area. Just about the level of usefulness that you'd like to have. And in fact, one of the practicalities that comes out is that you have to spend enough money. And because of the fact that the critical issue on all these networks, whether it be wireless, cellular, or, or Wi-Fi, or WiMAX, is the client, the uplink. As we talked about 3D, we want to do HD video. That's all about the power in the client. The only way to make that work is by having an infrastructure that's dense enough and invested enough that, in fact, you have enough capacity, which means that you have to put out 50 nodes per square mile for a wireless network or more. You have an infrastructure that's adequate for the task. And lastly, the perils of technology hype. <clears throat> These fantasy business models met overhyped products, which led to the fact that you, in most of these early networks, there was underinvestment in the infrastructure by a factor of two, and a set of applications that essentially could not exist. And a poor understanding, in fact, a poor understanding of the effects of scale. We use the word mesh in a way that is way too general to describe the specifics of how these networks need to be architected and deployed in a way that needs lots of wire. And so we had an argument this morning about wire versus wireless. Um, having served now done enterprise networks for the past, and wide area networks for the past 30 years, Wi-Fi and other networks like it are an extension of wire. Wire will always be faster. It will always be cheaper. It only goes where it goes, though. So if you want a service where you are as opposed to the wire ends, wireless is the extension that's required. They cooperate together. Well, all right. Well, commitment works. What we found is, is that where there are committed users, and right now, actually, the Muni wireless business is prospering. If you look at companies like Tropos and Bayer and uh, Firetide, uh, they're actually doing very well. And they're doing very well because they're selling to public safety, people that have, actually have money in applications that are real, automated meter reading, parking meters for a small section of the city where you can actually do uh, you know, I've heard from the CIOs that parking meters have a six-month return on investment. They're, they're cash, they're immense cash cows. And so being able to actually do concrete applications where there's skin in the game, not fantasy, skin in the game, allows you to lay an infrastructure out there that, in fact, can be used for many other things in the future. So, for example, these video surveillance systems, um, I was recently looking at a fire tide system in Chicago of 200 nodes. They're shipping on the order of a gigabit a second of video traffic through that network. Huge capacity. And 11M is now going to probably take that to another factor of four in terms of capacity. So we're seeing, beginning to see the infrastructure of technology allows us to build real applications in real ways as long as we understand that someone needs to pay. 
Second piece is that we learned how we ought to deploy it. One of the things I discovered and was actually very surprised about was that in surveying all these wireless networks, and you can probably, I've done Philadelphia three times, I've done St. Cloud twice, I've done um, Minneapolis twice, Toronto, we can make a long list, that the best of these networks, as measured last year, using technology that was invented three years ago, they basically will outperform next year's WiMAX networks. If you, go to, if you go to Minneapolis today, take your laptop out on the street, it's cold outside right now, but if you take your laptop out on the street, it's a low-end G laptop, <coughs> you'll probably get two megabits per second up and three megabits per second down just about everywhere in the footprint covered by the Minneapolis network. I've recently come from measuring Portland for WiMAX. I get one and a half megabits down and 250 kilobits up. WiMAX is, last, is roughly equivalent right now to very good 3G cellular. And the other piece is if you're deploying WiMAX, it's about a $500,000 $500, capital cost per square mile. And if you look at the best technology for 11N right now to deploy today, you can probably deploy 11N per square mile at a capital cost of roughly $100,000 at greater capacity, radio capacity per square mile. So some data. <coughs> um, I was very intrigued to see the measurements I've recently taken in the past few weeks to data I took two years ago. Cellular data has roughly doubled in speed and capacity in the last two years. So right now, going into your typical city, and it varies by vendor to vendor, you're seeing about 500 kilobits per second up, and you're seeing about a, a megabit to a mega, mega and a half down. If you get less, change your provider. Um, roughly, mobile WiMAX looks to be, it's actually a lower uplink than cellular. Um, I was surprised to see that the, the two networks that I've been able to measure, which is Baltimore and Portland, actually have a lower uplink than cellular, about half the uplink speed, um, and about 50% greater on the downlink, but not compellingly faster. It's not a revolutionary change, it's an incremental change. The best impressive piece is that existing Muni Wi-Fi, if done well, appropriately with technology, is amazingly good. So what's the foundation for wireless 2.0? Investment, not freedom from cost. Nobody cares about things we get from free. Let's pay for it. Caution about navigating technology hype. Wireless and extension. Wi-Fi was, was overhyped, under-delivered, and frankly, now we're going to be superlative. O211N has all the technology of mobile WiMAX at a tenth the cost. It does MIMO. You can buy it in commodity devices. If you have an Apple laptop, Intel laptop, it's built into it today. If you take it to a municipal wireless network, it's twice, the, uh, tw it's twice as good on the existing municipal wireless networks as your old 11G clients. And WiMAX is just about the point of, it has a very good, actually WiMAX is, don't get me wrong, WiMAX is very good, but it, let's keep it appropriate. It's overhyped, it's not salvation. And lastly, trust but verify, to use an old Reagan term. Um, it's easy to deploy a network, it's very hard to make it work right. And it's very important to test it and make sure that you actually deliver what you thought you got. A couple of coming attractions I'll leave you with. In the next two months, you'll see us come out with the first major study, independent study, of all the 3G and 4G networks in the United States. 13 U.S. cities, major vendors, tested in identical locations, 300 locations, 5,000 tests. Um, I think it's pretty compelling in terms of what it tells us about what the state of wireless is in the U.S., the second piece, we're about to actually do the first definitive testing of enterprise .11n testing. And that is also very impressive in terms of what 11. Um, one hint, uh, we can see on an 11n access point gets us about 180 megabits per second of capacity compared to an 11g, which is 20 megabits of capacity. It's an amazing increase in capacity and skill. Thank you.
Okay, um, thanks. I'm very, very thrilled to, to speak here. Um, I know Sasha for some time already. Um, we met through the, the wireless, community wireless movement. And um, I gave this talk act actually recently at the Berkman Center. Um, changed a bit, few things. So um, I'm going to talk about the Wi Fi networks, community Wi Fi networks in Europe. Some of you already know about it a bit, but I think most people here in this room haven't heard that we have pretty large functioning Wi-Fi mesh networks in Europe. By large, I mean covering cities. So what I think the, the whoops, uh, this is going too fast here. Okay. So I think for me, the motivation to build these networks was, was basically um, we need a few, we have a few important values in, in our modern digital network societies. Open source, and even though Brett G said, oh, it's leftist buzzwords, it's not, it's about freedom of speech. That's very, very important. For, uh, controlling our own software, controlling our own hardware in the long run. Whoop, does this work here? In the long run, our own hardware, because otherwise we don't know what's inside that hardware. And the third is open networks. And this should give us open content in the long run. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 this is going too fast, I'm sorry. So, now it should work. Okay, so I want to start with, uh, actually, very soon, I didn't know that Sasha was preparing that uh, part about the, the radio amateurs. I started with a very similar quote. Um, but, but Brecht uh, said in, uh, uh, in 32 that he was envisioning a vast network of pipes, quote, <laughs> built by the radio, if it would be a two-way communication system. We know what happened. It became the most effective system to control people in Europe during, and Russia uh, during uh, the 30s and 40s. So, no? Okay, anyway. So, what, would, what do we have currently now with the Internet? The other aspect why I think we need these meshed uh, networks is Currently, we have the Internet is a scale-free network, meaning it has very central nodes. This is on the one side, it's a very good thing because you can reach any, any hub very quickly. On the other hand, it means we have lots of concentration on the key nodes, and um, it is getting very centralized. And opposed to that, in Vienna, we built, like in many European cities, we built very decentralized, bottom-up, mesh networks, and this is a picture of the Vienna mesh network um, taken a couple of days ago. You can see the green lines are uh, long distance Wi-Fi links, uh, lots of directional and pan panel antennas, and also omni antennas, so we, we take everything we can, we mix it. Uh, red is like the quality is not so good, and yellow is in between. Now we have uh, 240 roofs there with multiple devices, and other cities in Europe performed even better. So these networks are scale, uh, also scale-free. That's pretty interesting. A pretty interesting result, but less. Uh, um, they're more meshed. They're they're less centralized. Okay. So um, I do believe in the, in the long run, if layer two, that was a very interesting what you said, if layer two becomes more robust and better than the current Wi-Fi solution that we have now, BG, usually, and even A. And if, and if we can get more spectrum, then in the long run, we're going to have a very, very resistant, uh, failure-resistant network with Wi-Fi, or the next thing after Wi-Fi. And I think also what, ha what, what, what I saw in, in, in the networks in Europe is that people got together and they started to build their networks on their own. There was no funding there. Um, so we started to, you know, in, in Vienna it was like that. We just bought the remains of, an, of a dying uh, small ISP, got a few central switches, got a few, uh, start, a few starting uh, hardware for st starting the whole network, and we started to innovate. And the innovation was happening at the edge of the network. And this was totally th thrilling experience. Yeah? And our motivation in Vienna was to have a censorship-resistant network because uh, all, the, um, all the laws were coming to France, like three strikes out. People suddenly, or the, the government in that case, suddenly would re uh, 
maybe reserve the rights to disconnect you from the internet in case you do too much file sharing. So this is, again, freedom of speech. It's very important to not allow that. We had issues with you know, data retention laws, so we tried to um, go around that. And the most important thing is that we wanted to have our own network. So this is, again, controlling your own freedom of speech, basically. So in Vienna, we um, basically got a very nice kickstart. We got 10 roofs to start with. Um, actually, there was a small chapter in a book uh, describing their, like this, this Wi-Fi network, and it never worked. And this guy who built it basically wants to get rid of it. So I called him up and said, can we have those notes? <laughs> and he said, yep, I'm not going to uh, do anything with that. We started to experiment with OLSR, mesh routing protocol. This was the first thing which worked for us in practice. Um, the others just at that time didn't work. I think by now we have a multitude of very interesting mesh routing protocols. And so what we did is we invited the public and said, OK, we're going to build this network. Who's in? Who wants to join? So we got uh, lots of interest from the tech community, geek community. And um, currently, right now in Vienna, we have, as I said, 240 roofs, around uh, well 670 routing table entries. Um, that means basically devices plus a little bit extra. And this network has been repeated in different cities in Austria and Graz and um, in an unders underserved uh, remote area, Weinviertel. Um, it's the longest things of 30 kilometers, and um, we have a very, very active community, and they actually love innovating. That's, I think, the main driving force there. And we're starting to build our fiber connections. Now, this didn't only happen in Vienna. It also happened in Barcelona, all around Barcelona. It happened in Jerusalem, in Denmark. Uh, that's a very well-documented example. Basically, it was left out from the telecom industry. This happened in Berlin. They've been very innovative in, in the beginning, especially. Now they're experimenting a lot with IP version 6. This happened in Athens Wireless. Uh, in Athens, there's the Athens Wireless Network. And Greece is a perfect place for Wi-Fi because you have, the, you know, you have open spaces, the ocean, the sea, and uh, uh, hills and mountains. Um, so you have a great Grenelle zone. This also happened in Paris, and uh, finally the Czech uh, free network is almost covering the whole country. So I'm going to show you a bit. Well, first going to go to the, the networks here. So this is a map, a recent map uh, of the Athens wireless network. I'm zoom just zooming in on Athens. You can't see the city anymore on, on Google Earth. If you want, drop me a note afterwards. I'll give you the, the URL to the folks there. And uh, uh, it's great. They just, just um, built 2,400 nodes there. And there's a very interesting aspect to it. If you have uh, 2,400 nodes, you suddenly have a, um, a community which has a sort of an internal network even. So they start to share internally. So they have local content. Uh, the Czech Republic is, as I said, here's a map. Here below you can see the Czech Republic here, and all around Prague is totally covered. The major, all the other major cities are also covered. Again, because DSL was too expensive at that time when they started to build up. The network around Barcelona is 5,000 nodes. Uh, we know the guy who's uh, very, who was one of the key uh, important persons there, Ramon. So uh, they're they're doing great. And yeah, Freifunk has that repeated in a couple of cities. OK, I think I should stop now. I um, just want to say one more nice thing is uh, I, I started um, in Italy, I started uh, to build a small network close to Torino. And um, they bribed me with nice, nice architecture uh, and good food and good wine and good coffee. So I went there. We even had to make a company for that, but it, I tell you, it was a thrill to drill into this 400 years old wall <laughs> and to attach a Wi-Fi antenna there. And we asked, you know, is that, is that actually OK? Can we do that? And they said, yeah, we have plenty of those. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so here you see the, the first uh, antennas of the Torino network. And um, they're also looking into fiber now. So we have a, a very nice uh, 
combination of fiber and Wi-Fi. And now I think I want to briefly also still mention, uh, where is Brian from Boston, Open Air Boston? I, I, I helped uh, the folks in Open Air Boston. So I think uh, it became uh, part of the European networks now. <laughs> um, so they're also starting something like that now, and that's it. Thanks. Hey, Aaron, before you sit down, did, when I was looking, you didn't show the map of Vienna, did you? I did, actually, in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then never mind. I stood, stepped out for a second. Okay. It's okay. Thank you. I'm going to take my uh, chance with the mic here and see how well I can do looking at my predecessors on this panel. Uh, my talk, since I'm capping this, this panel, is to um, sort of build on what my predecessors have done. I've got a lot of good stuff to, to build on here. Um, Sasha's essentially uh, plowed the ground for uh, uh, some of the remarks I want to make with respect to the historical perspective in the regulatory environment. To me, the biggest barrier to wireless has always been and probably will always be regulatory, the regulatory environment. Um, we try to get it right, and then we like, you know, one step forward, eight steps backwards and stuff. But think about this, all right? Look at what you're doing in this room right now, OK? with wireless access, okay? Five years ago, there were those out there that would say what you're doing right now in this room is impossible and would never, ever happen, okay? Because there would be congestive collapse, uh, interference, the noise floor would be raised, whatever, okay? But you know what? It works, okay? All right, so it's really just about engineering and reality. And what's the, the biggest problem we faced here is that our regulations over the last century with respect to wireless technologies has been based on something else other than reality, politics, okay, not technology, right? So what I'd like to do is to get back to technology-based rulemaking, okay? So let me elaborate that a little bit. Larry Lessig wrote a book about 10 years ago called Code is Law, okay? And not to get into that, but just so that he covered the software domain, or the soft domain, and for me, in the wireless domain, I paraphrase that, or I have a different slogan to describe what, how that would work with wireless, which is, the tools make the rules. The tools make the rules, because if you have smart radios that are actually out there sifting the spectrum, they're in the best position to know what's going on rather than some rules written on stone tablets, okay? So the wireless thing about wireless is dynamic. It changes all the time. It's all about moving energy around from point A to point B, okay? So the tools should make the rules, right? So that, and so it, uh, the amateur radio services were brought up several times here. I've been a ham since I was teenagers, teenagers. So what that's given me is a viewpoint into the art of the possible. Okay, in that I have access to lots of spectrum, I can build equipment, and I can put it into service without asking the government for permission. So under my license authority, over the years I've done magical things, would seem like magic to some of you. But what it's shown me is that here's what you can do with wireless without regulatory constraints, because the amateur radio services run as an open commons. All right, and what you're doing today is you're running devices in an open commons, all right? Now, what the dark forces would not like to admit is that, hey, you know, it's like this unlicensed spectrum environment that got kicked off in the early 80s, you know, and came out with the Part 15 rules, which was not the original uh, vision of the government. The original vision was to turn the entire radio spectrum into an open commons. So what we got are just some small little bands. But again, as an amateur radio operator, I've had a lot more spectrum to play with over the years, as has my colleagues. And we've done some remarkable things about it. But now, even with the spectrum that you guys have available, and people like Aaron, you know, it's like, look at what's happening at the grassroots level, okay? 
So you start to sort of salivate when you think about, well, what if we really went back to that original vision and made the entire spectrum open, all right? Well, we fought for that, and basically what happened was uh, during the uh, mid-'90s, there was a push for something called uh, uh, spectrum underlay, also known as spectrum overlay, and there was actually a rulemaking cut called interference temperature. Okay. There was also another significant rulemaking during the period, which was about receiver standards. The idea was that the current rules basically um, give preference to essentially ear trumpets, effectively, okay? receivers that are really obsolete, but we have to protect those devices forever. Okay? So what the commission proposed in that rulemaking was that, hey, you know, that's not right. And at some point, there's a drop-dead date for these devices, and they go away like the dinosaur, okay? Well, Chairman Martin flushed those two rulemakings down the toilet, okay? So what it means now is that with the new administration, we've got to start back, you know, 10 years of work was flushed down the toilet. So we've got to start climbing that hill again. And hopefully this time it will be easier because reality works, and that, like Ken's work, you know, again, reality-based stuff is showing and providing examples that's going to make it harder and harder for the dark forces to stop this movement, okay? Because the difference now from 10 years ago is that you guys are all participants in this, okay? The art of the possible, that magic wand has touched you guys on the head, okay? And you know what? You want more of this because it's good, okay? It enables lots of things, all right? So I want to conclude by talking about, um, uh, again, the theme that Sasha used about the mistakes of the past and how we forget, OK? 10 years, well, in, in 2000, in this area here in Maryland, in, in fact, in, in, I could say inside this theater, there was a company that deployed vast wireless network that covered Maryland, DC, and parts of Virginia. It's called Metricom, okay? Some of you may remember Metricom and that with a ricochet modem, you could sit the internet right here for about between 100 and 150 kilobits per second, all right? Well, they're gone now, but they spent a billion dollars of uh, investor capital to put deploy this network. So where it was deployed, it was great, all right? But it showed you that these were what, municipal networks of their time, okay? But Municipal Networks 1.0, okay, forgot all of that learning, okay? Because what they did on the regulatory front was they used the unlicensed spectrum. That's great. It was there, and they used it. But the other thing they did was permits in that they put their radios on light poles, okay? So they plowed a lot of new ground, and that was, another, that was part of the reasons why they went out of business, because that, that was a massive effort, and it took a lot of time to negotiate those agreements. But when Union Wireless 1.0 kicked off, well, it was like Metricon never happened. And there were no lawyers out there saying, well, we have a president because, you know, this was done here. And why are we going to go through this whole process again? Because it was already done by these guys. You see? So that's how we fail to learn from the lessons of the past. We've got to get smarter about this, okay, in the new attempt, okay? Because now we've got buckets of money coming from the feds, okay, to do all types of neat things. So for God's sake, let's not go back and do it over again, you know, and make, repeat the mistakes of the past. You know, we got to be better than this. There was an effort um, that failed uh, while well, was Silicon Valley in my neck of the woods, okay? So there, Metrocom covered more than the area that while well, Silicon Valley was going to talking about covering, okay? From San Jose all the way up to Santa Rosa, okay? Massive area if you look at it on a map, okay? Well, while Silicon Valley didn't get anywhere because they had to dicker with all the different municipalities covering the, that area for permits to put radios on light poles and whatever, okay? So, and I talked to people in, involved with the project about this, and it was like I was speaking in tongues, you know? And Again, it's like, again, it's like something like Metrocom in 2000 and went out of business in essentially 2002. It was like it never happened. And how can that be, you know? I mean, how can that be? But I tell you, it was like I felt I was in a different uh, cone of reality, you know? 
where, but, okay, I'm starting to rant here. So, look, so to finish, it's regulatory, okay? It's that, all right? We've got to do some Jedi mind tricks, okay, this time around, okay? We've got to play the game better because the technology is there in terms of what Ken's been saying. We've got some great technology out there to play with now. And the economics are pretty damn good, okay, a lot better than they were. And it's going to get better and better and better. So let's go out and do good work. Thank you. Okay, so um, we left enough time for questions. We have about, David, how much? About, I'd say, 20 minutes? Okay. We have time for questions, so please come up to that microphone. And uh, we have a mic two microphones here for the speakers. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Oh, yes, the mob there that's been yakking on the chat box. Yeah. <laughs> Pose your questions now. <laughs> I'm a placeholder for Hillary Gardner, who's far over on that end. She's in Mendocino, California, and it's, there's a lot of hills, mountainous area. There's a lot of big trees. So wireless isn't really going to do it. Fiber is. But now the problem is that the incumbents come in and make uh, statements like, we're totally not going to support this. We'll challenge any kind of muni effort that you have. Uh, and the situation seems to not be move forwardable. Do you have any suggestions for what she might think about to get around, like to incorporate Jedi mind tricks? Uh, one quick thought. Um, you know, one of the greatest benefits of the Philadelphia Wireless Network is, was to reduce the DSL cost in Philadelphia. And um, while it's awfully awkward to do wireless in places with hills and trees and organic material, it's not impossible. And um, you can begin to put in uh, the beginnings of a network, and I'd be, I bet you'd be amazed to see how fast that might stimulate fiber. Um, <laughs> Pardon? They won't, they won't touch it. Well, then you should. Well, uh, either you, you know, your choices are, are, are very, very few here. I mean, wireless can work in that environment. It's difficult. You need to do it properly and engineer it properly. Um, but. Um, if that's the only choice and you can't pull anybody, convince anybody to pull a piece of copper or a piece of, a piece of fiber, wireless works. You can set one up today. Call me a hump. Uh, I agree with Ken. Basically, is I think it's important to get existence proofs out there. Because once, again, it's about the art of the possible. Once you show, once you show people that something's possible, even in the kind of environment you're talking about with trees, hills, and whatever, I mean, we know it'll work. It's just it's an engineering deal. Okay? Get out there, do it, and then let it build. The other uh, thing which helped is maybe from, from experience. We had in um, Fung Fung Weinfeld, a remote area close to the Czech border. We had a journalist. Uh, his, his mother lives there. And so every time he, he went there, he wrote in um, his blog that he can't get internet access. And the telecom industry is like too slow and doesn't work and he's waiting for months and months. So he wrote that and then he wrote a second article, oh I got a phone fire there and two weeks later he got a, got a call from the Telecom Austria, so that's fine, yeah. <laughs> Humiliation of large organizations often works, you know, it's a wonderful tool. Yep. Um, First, uh, well, I'm Harold Feld. First, uh, I have to say, yeah, Dwayne, uh, based on your depression about the situation last year, if I can echo, welcome back to the fight. This time I know our side will win. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I did want to well, put out there, and it, it dovetails uh, some with uh, the question that was just asked, but I was hoping um, that uh, you all could talk uh, a little, I think, about the uh, uh, the question of the mix of business models and the uh, uh, the question of how do you measure success in your area. Uh, particularly, this is always where the the uh, uh, incumbents try very hard to stop 
programs by pointing to, well, it's not going to, it's not going to pay for itself. It's going to be a waste, and and um, to put barriers against the spending of public money. Uh, I um, would. Uh, ask you all, are there uh, uh, other ways to talk about these things and ways we should be talking about these things? Sasha um, um, kicked it off, I think, very nicely with some of the ways to talk about these things, but perhaps you might uh, talk about how you talk about these things in a way that uh, uh, doesn't mean you have to show that this is going to turn a profit within a year or something ridiculous like that. Okay, let, let me start actually with real, real life um, uh, cases here about how various cities have managed to get away from the oh no, it's the government trying to kill competition paradigm. Uh, cities like um, Rock Hill, South Carolina, and even New York City, actually, what they've done is they've said, well, we're only installing a new wireless automated meter reading system. So they talk about it from the point of view of, of a municipal service. That is how they've come at it. So they say, okay, we're going to replace everyone's water meters. We're going to replace the monitoring of uh, sewage facilities and electric plants and water stations. And we're creating a network that basically monitors all of this in real time. It saves people money because they can see how much water and electricity they're consuming. It saves the city and utility money. They come at it from the application point of view because that's what people understand. If you tell someone, if a mayor or a city council member comes up to you and says, I'm going to replace your water meter because it's going to help you save money, it's going to help us save money, and we're going to lower your water bill, basically anybody else who comes in, like an incumbent, that says, yeah, but they're also setting up this wireless system that's going to compete with AT&T or whatever it is. I mean, this is falling on deaf ears because the guy would just say, yeah, but he's saving me, you know, my water bill. And by the way, it's great that I get Wi-Fi in the public parks and whatever. So you have to come about it not from a very theoretical way of speaking to people, which is what we've been doing so far. We talk about connectivity for the sake of connectivity. People don't understand that. They want to know how are they going to save money, how are they going to be able to get, let's say, on their iPhone or iPod Touch, you know, how when they're walking around, where can they look at an address in a Google map, where can they find things on their, on their little devices. People understand that. If you approach it from that standpoint, talking like ordinary people, you don't get into this whole regulatory business of, oh, but, you know, there's specter. I mean, that's important, but you have to really win kind of the, the, the minds of common people and say, this is what this is going to do. How can you be against it? And when you approach it that way, it's easier for the city council members to actually put these plans into effect. These networks cost money. Someone has to buy this equipment. Someone has to operate it. You have to buy bandwidth. So in all cases, you have to follow the money. So someone has to pay for it. It's not free. So the best way to deploy these networks is to find a concrete, real application in which you show productivity enhancement, you show uh, real economic return. Perhaps the the um, parking meter is the, the closest thing to gambling that I think I've seen in terms of return and investment to municipalities. And, and these essentially become very concrete applications. I mean, um, these... What has been very interesting to me is the resurrection of the municipal wireless business largely based on these concrete applications. If you look at real equipment vendors deploying real equipment at scale, they are selling for video surveillance, parking meters, automated meter reading, public safety, and these are going into just about every city of any size in the U.S., and I'm sure the stimulus dollars are going to, every one of these cities is busily writing stimulus proposals to increase these networks. This is the foundation on which we can build high-capacity wireless systems. And the key issue is once you put these in, you put them in a way that you can use it for other applications other than the ones you, you put them in initially. So building extra capacity, which leads us to the spectrum issues. One of the pieces that my measurements indicate, which I think is kind of interesting, is that certainly inside municipalities where you have lots of multipath and, 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 and buildings, um, it turns out that 802.11n has an unintended consequence. It actually makes the 5 gigahertz bandwidth interesting. <laughs> and it turns out that it adds about 500 megahertz of capacity that looks like 2 gigahertz um, for 802.11g. So if we use 802.11n at 5 gigahertz, we've just added 5, 5x five the spectrum outdoors, okay, magically. No new regulation. It's all there. It works. 
And by the way, also uh, in, four point, in the 4.9 spectrum, it's all Wi-Fi, so the public safety 150 megahertz that's used there is all being deployed as largely as uh, Wi-Fi. 3.65, there's 50, there's 25 megahertz there that is actually a very good spectrum. That if you uh, actually we deploy it there with 802.11n, will be three bits per hertz, be 75 megabits of capacity in 3.65. So is it, is it, with the new technology of frequency agile systems using dot 11 n with nano with smart antennas we have the ability to have several gigabits of capacity free unlicensed of widely available outdoors and actually it's good that it doesn't penetrate walls because what it means is it doesn't interfere with people's indoor networks we now have the separation of the indoor and outdoor world and it costs you fifty dollars to breach the membrane Buy a repeater if you need to, just like a DSM modem. You build two cooperating networks, two, the outdoor network and the indoor network, each of which has immense capacity and unlicensed. So I'll, I'll just add to that that, you know, fundamentally we have to change the way we view connectivity in the society. So no one wants to live in a community that says, look, you know, our return on investment for primary education wasn't so good, but once we cut out every other grade, it was great because we understand like education is important. Nobody wants to live in a community that says don't have a fire on Tuesday and Thursday because we don't have fire protection then. There's certain fundamental things you get for living in a civil society and connectivity needs to be one of them. And I'm actually business model agnostic. I don't really care if it's public sector, private sector, municipal sector, you know, crazy anarchist freaks in their garage sector. Like, I just want to see it get done. And I want to ensure that there aren't artificial barriers to different groups getting this done. So, Sasha, here's a business model agnostic. Actually, it's not. It's a. It's a. It's trying to cut through the religion that some of us perceive up here. Not that it's bad religion. I mean, um, uh, but but uh, David Young asked a really good question on the chat. He said, "Why isn't? Why isn't?" And he. He very nicely, he works at Verizon, for those of you don't, who don't know. But he said, why don't we use Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile or any of that for meter reading and, um, and parking meters? And I think it's a pretty good question. I could answer that very quickly. It's like the same. It's too expensive. Yeah. yeah. Talk, to, I talk to any city and ask them why they are putting in a Wi-Fi network to replace putting in Verizon and police cars. It's, it's too expensive to pay $60 a month per police car, and it doesn't give you uplink video. So it's an, incom it's an incompetent network and not, not and too expensive. Oh. Wait a minute. Do you want to rebuttal? <coughs> no, I, I think that's. The challenge then is for low bandwidth, yes. Then the challenge becomes, is, uh, I think I differ with my colleague um, Dwayne about the death of Metrocom. I think Metrocom died because they were inventing dial-up wireless service just when DSL was coming happening. They were, they were, fact, they were 100x too slow. And I think that's the challenge with the 3G network is the issue of how much capacity and speed you really have available in the spectrum you have available, the technology deployed. And I think the challenge would be from the so from the public safety systems I've been doing it, if you want to talk about putting real-time video in police cars or in public safety, it can't be done at scale. So you can begin to harvest some of these low level, but you can't really get to the meat of the issue. So one of the tech problems with 3G, and I argue with WiMAX to some extent, <laughs> will be enough, having enough capacity. Even WiMAX for uh, Sprint only has 100, you know, has 100 megahertz at so three bits per hertz. We have 5x that in the unlicensed band. <laughs> Rich, hi, I'm, I'm Rich McKinnon from the Austin Wireless City Project. Um, I guess part of today's panel is we're trying to look at the, now the, sm the smoking uh, ruins, uh, the municipal wireless effort, and and as we've brought out, you know. There is actually two reasons. One is the, the failed business models, right? But then the other reason, which hasn't really been brought up too much except just a moment ago, which is what is the state of affairs of the, tele, the telco companies as we begin to regroup? Uh, will they resurface again as worthy adversaries when it comes to uh, legislation as unfriendly to the renewed efforts to uh, build community networks and municipal networks? 
what can we do differently to beat them? One quick thing to think about is that it, uh, I, I, I'm finding this argument, this, I'm with two minds about this issue of video surveillance, for example, in cities. On a, on, a, on a personal freedom issue, I'm not sure I want cameras watching me all the time. On the other hand, it's a great driver for an application that you just simply can't do on, on the public carriers. <laughs> so uh, if you look at what's driving capacity, many of the cities have a, a, an immense amount of fiber underneath the streets that goes to traffic lights that is largely unused, that is a great asset to make use of a wedding, and in fact, the, the ability to do video surveillance is driving the ability to make high capacity, high bandwidth, wireless and wired networks in many of these cities. And that, I think, can ultimately be a public good. That, in fact, the major carriers are not quite, don't quite know what to do with that. You can't do it on cellular. There's not enough capacity. This is a quick spectrum question. When, uh, Ken, when you were describing the different networks in terms of towers per square miles, and I kept thinking of Shannon's law and contiguous spectrum, could you just outline really quick, you mentioned the three bits per hertz, you know, who has the spectrum where, and is there a bottleneck forming there with the 700 megahertz, or just real quick? Uh, real quick. Uh, real quick on spectrum allocation? Yeah. I don't so one of, one of, one of the one of, well, first, um, we're all driving to the same semiconductor technology. So MIMO technologies, multiple in, multiple out, is going to drive us to roughly an average of three bits per hertz of effective capacity. And that'll be true for dot eleven n it'll be true for LTE, and it'll be true for YMX. All the major technologies will have roughly the same spectral efficiency. Then the question is, how much spectrum do you have? And uh, most of the telecom spectrum is allocated in chunks of 5 to 10 megahertz maybe 20 megahertz, except for Clearwire, which has 100 megahertz in the US. Um, then we have all the unlicensed spectrum in various bits and chunks. But one of the cool things about dot 11 n outdoors, in terms of wall penetration, is that it begins to have some of the coverage properties with MIMO that you have at 2.4. So that it begins to, be very, begins to be a very useful technology again where right now it wouldn't go around corners, it would be horrible in terms of fading. With 11N, fading is a goodness. You like fading. It makes the system better. So um, one of the challenges as we move forward is that the conventional spectrum allocation of narrow channels um, is limiting. We're going to have much more capacity in the unlicensed bands than we will have in the licensed bands with similar types of technologies. The other difference is a base station that uses MIMO with three sectors of coverage is going to be $150,000 for 10 megahertz chunks in three sectors, giving you roughly 100 megabits of capacity. Well, we've got an access point in this room that probably costs $2,000 is 100 megabits of capacity. Okay, so the drive for having dot eleven n is now in this incredible consumer drive for truck decreasing semiconductor costs that uses the same technology as LTE and um, YMAX. And that, so it's, it, here you double whammy at more spectrum at cheaper cost. So I think we're a little bit out of, out of time now. David has been shaking, okay, <laughs> shaking his, his clock. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Judy's friend from Mendocino, and I'd like um, Ken's home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, in addition to that, we're, we've been experimenting with wireless. We've been doing quite a lot of point-to-point. -point, but in addition to the physical impediments that we have for wireless out on the coast, we have some serious social impediments. And I was hoping someone on the panel or maybe in the audience could help us. We've got serious militant opponents to wireless who live on the coast, who live there because they're against. If you know Arthur Furstenberg, who's made a living of going out and opposing wireless networks, um, we, we've, we had a wireless network, county owned, in the school, and it was ripped out because it was um, harming the children. We have a teacher who's still out on disability because of the uh, physical impacts of her exposure to wireless in the school when it was in. These people show up at every public hearing we have to roll it out. We've got a symposium coming up, county run, on April 8th. If I could have 
anything in defense of, of wireless. Um, something to contract Lena Berman, who's all over the NPR airwaves up there with, um, with health warnings to, pr to protect your home from these people. You need a health, find a radiation physicist from your local hospital. Okay, my guess to you, because in fact you're getting, you're probably getting more exposure from cosmic rays coming down, penetrating your buildings, than you are from any kind of health physics from radio waves. So what you need is facts, and and the, and the most compelling facts is this relative issue of relative risk. And the relative risk issue is the fact that we all live in a world filled with radiation. Like radiation if you live in brick buildings, you're you're getting much more radiation than you're getting from a cell phone, and it's, it's a more dangerous radiation. <laughs> So the, 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 the issue of one of relative risk, I'm, I, I, would, I would find a, a religious, passionate radiation, phys, radiation uh, uh, physicist or physician and have them just do the simple physics and do it often. You know, uh, like the, uh, basically the, the same answer, would, I, was, I was also confronted a few times with that question and the very, very similar, very clear answers asked the, the, the guy who, with whom we're talking about uh, radiation issues, uh, asked him if he has a mobile phone in his, in his pocket. And uh, if yes, then um, you know, compare 30 times the strength. Okay. Just a, a, a quick observation for any super quick comment, which was that uh, the statement that was made that um, surveillance applications were a main driver for uh, the provision of, of network access or um, municipal wireless was extremely um, interesting to me since it seems already that privacy uh, is a cost of access to this kind of universal uh, bandwidth. And I just wonder whether any of the panelists have a comment about the intersection between issues of privacy rights and uh, sort of broader digital identity issues relative to the rights to access as a basic requirement of a civil society. Those seem to be on a collision course at this moment, and I haven't heard the issues of digital identity or digital privacy or rights beyond concerns over privacy be even uh, tacitly mentioned. I have one personal comment. This is not, not going to help you. I started my career as an engineer doing computer security. Mm. I got out of it to move the networks because it, it was a solvable problem. And uh, the issue, once you, once you move into an internet-connected world, it's, you're doomed. <laughs> yep, right. I started with building networks like Funfly, then I moved into IT security. I work now at the National CERT. Um, you know, let me rephrase your question and say, if you import goods from China, electronics, which, I mean, I'm just saying dollar country, China, in that case, um, and that contains uh, hardware that you haven't checked. Uh, this could co contain rootkits. This could be a really deep breach of privacy on the network card level. Um, so the only solution that I found so far is trying to really build it on my own. But this is a very long and very painful and very bottom-up approach. And at some point, you have to just estimate what, what, what you're going to accept in, in the general tr uh, uh, development of technology, and in the sense of uh, video surveillance, I think it's always, always really depends on, on the on the actual application and the actual use of that. If you give it to sh small shop owners, it might be not so bad after all. If you give it to uh, like I don't know on the streets for public spaces, you know, you have to discuss with the public. I, I, I go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me just add that. David. Privacy, I I'd be short. <laughs> privacy and, and connectivity are not mutually exclusive or necessarily even in opposition. But when they're mediated through business models that are trying to commoditize your privacy and information, and et cetera, well, then you run into these problems time and time again. And time again. And so, really, what we have to we have to just become aware that you know we're not talking about just connectivity. If we were just talking about connectivity, you'd have and, and in encryption, and you'd have ways to deal with this privacy issue. Uh, but what we're talking about is connectivity mediated through, you know, the, these s command and control infrastructures that people are building in order to create tolling and to create new revenue sources and to extract more resources from you at the end. No, I, I, I just disagree. Um, you can do end-to-end -end security today. You can send all your email end-to-end -end encrypted. You could make all your own applications end-to-end -end encrypted. I would argue that no one chooses to use them. It's too, too hard. 
It's too much work. Okay. Um, with that, as the last message, the panel is concluded. And if you have questions, please come up to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Esme. Um, uh, I just want to note that the expertise in this room is truly overwhelming. The wireless experts in this audience um, who weren't on the panel include Dana Spiegel of New York Wireless, Michael Calabrese from New America Foundation, Rich McKinnon from Austin Wireless who asked that question, Glenn Strawn um, who's built wireless networks all over the world, uh, Tim Shepard who's a famous PhD thesis at MIT um, proved the scalability of wireless networks. Now we only need the technology to implement it, right, Tim? Uh, Brett Glass out there on the internet who runs a wireless network in Laramie, and Ken DiPietro who's also out there um, in the great beyond uh, with his uh, um, uh, many wireless ventures and insights. And now um, with, uh, uh, we are going to use uh, strings um, to convey a different form of communication. Take it away, boys.